Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Milsatich, and I am here with USA.gov. Um, welcome to today's Google Hangout. I am joined by Marietta Jelks, the Editor-in-Chief of the Consumer Action Handbook, and Holly Petraeus, our special guest who leads the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office of Service Member Affairs. Marietta and Holly are here today to answer questions from our service members and veterans about dealings with scams, fraud, debt, and other topics. Um, but before we get started and dive into all the questions you sent in, uh, Marietta and Holly, will you take a minute to introduce yourselves? Marietta, you can kick us off. Sure, Jess. As, as Jess mentioned, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Consumer Action Handbook from USA.gov, and it's really your free guide to being an informed consumer. Whether you're planning to buy a car, protect yourself from identity theft, file a complaint about an item you purchased that didn't work out, the handbook can help you with all that. And even if you're a veteran or a family member, of someone who's a service member and you're affected by debt collectors or fraud, the Consumer Action Handbook is a free and valuable tool to help you with all those things. And you can get a free copy um, from publications.usa.gov. You can download an electronic version or order a hard copy looking at publications.usa.gov. Hi, everybody. Holly Petraeus here. I'm one of the assistant directors of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I head their Office of Service Member Affairs. And um, my job really is to look out for service members and their families in uh, several ways to see that they get the financial education they need to make better informed consumer decisions, to monitor their complaints that come into our complaint system and the response to those complaints, and also to work with other federal and state agencies on consumer protection measures for the military. So kind of a wide tent that I operate under, and uh, the bottom line is I'm here to see that service members and veterans and retirees and their families um, are treated fairly in their consumer financial transactions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. We are so, much. so, happy, we are so happy to be here today with us. Today with us. Um, let's uh, go ahead let's and go get started. Uh, Marietta, uh, we know Marietta, Marietta, Marietta we know we out there who is there, who is trying to get our service our members service and their members and their veterans. Um, can you tell us can a little, tell little bit about the scams fraud that we run through? Um, and if you have a hint, we try to talk about several types of scams. A couple that really target service members are affinity fraud. And this is one where uh, service members are targeted by an investment professional or salesman, and they say that they can offer investment opportunities, lots of returns, and great investment um, growth. But it's really a fraud or a scam, and it really targets specific so service members, veterans, things like that. Another one is um, for a financial advisor, and say that they can help a veteran get a benefit. What they will tell you is that by uh, doing that, you could lose your Medicaid eligibility. You could not actually be eligible for these benefits, and you have to pay them back. And oh, by the way, maybe thousands of dollars to get, to get these benefits, which is unfortunate. Um, so those are just a couple of financial things. We have a lot of scams that use like veterans and military and charity, and those aren't really you know reliable charities. So. The scams are just rampant, but just really among service members or against service members. Well, thank you for that background. Uh, uh, thank you for that background. Uh, um, it's a shame to hear that there are so many uh, scams that are targeting some of our service members and veterans. Um, but luckily, there is some help available, um, especially to what CFPB offers. And Holly, can you tell us a little bit about what CFPB can do, um, specifically the Office of Service Member Affairs? Sure. Um, let me talk a little bit about the CFPB itself. Um, the agency was created in response to the economic meltdown back in sort of 2008 when all those toxic mortgages were written and almost took our economy off the cliff. And uh, one question the President and the Congress asked was, who's actually, who was looking out for consumers when all this happened? And the answer was there were a, a number of good federal consumer financial laws on the books but the enforcement was spread out among seven different federal agencies. So they decided they would create an agency specifically to look after consumers and migrate the enforcement of those laws over to it. So that, of course, is the CFPB. We opened our doors in July of 11, so we are a real newcomer. And um, we are really uh, there to see that the markets work for consumers, that uh, they can see what they're getting, you know, that 
that those would, who would use tricks uh, can't profit from them. And um, we have supervision power. That means we can go in and look at businesses and see what they're doing. Uh, we can also enforce against the ones that are breaking those laws that we enforce. And then my office, again, has a very military-specific focus. And um, I hate to see a service member sign a bad contract. I want them all to be educated enough not to get into just to get into some of the scams that you just described. described. And, uh, and uh, so we're so doing we're some educational some initiatives, both when they join the military and also after they get out, to give them some opportunity for financial coaching. Um, we're looking at their complaints and we do get a number of complaints from them and monitoring those. We've been able to get back a significant amount of money for service members who come to us with complaints. And uh, then I work with uh, other federal agencies on issues that impact the military and also the states. I've done a lot with the state attorneys general and the state directors of veterans affairs. So um, quite a lot going on and uh, all of it designed really, again, to make the financial markets work for those whom we serve. Um, it's really great to know that all those resources are out there and just to hear a little bit about the work you do. Um, and I know we got tons of questions in from lots of different people, so I think we should probably start tackling some of those and just jump right into specific issues. One of the topics that came up over and over again in the emails was people asking for advice on dealing with debt collectors. That seems to be a really big problem across the board. Um, so Holly, can you start and tell us a little bit about where some members of veterans can go for help if they are having problems with the debt collector? Sure. Um, I will say that uh, debt collection is, at this point, um, our number one complaint both from consumers as a whole and also from the military because when someone uh, files a complaint with CFPB we do ask them if they're military, a veteran, or a dependent of one of those and it is uh, the number one complaint and we just started taking those complaints in 2013 so it shows you it's really on everybody's mind. A lot of them are suffering from you know, very bad practices by data collectors who are doing a number of things, hounding them where they work, um, in the mili case of the military, threatening to get them demoted, threatening to get their security clearance pulled, just a lot of things that are absolutely not in line with the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So if they have a service member or veteran who feels that a debt collector is not treating them properly, they can file a complaint with us at uh, our website, consumerfinance.gov, or at 855-411-CFPB. Um, they can also um, think about going to their state attorney general's office because they all have a consumer division and they are very interested in knowing about folks who are breaking laws within their state. Wonderful. Um, anything that you wanted to add in terms of um, rules of dealing with debt collectors, things like that? Sure. Holly alluded to it a little bit in her comments. But just reminding people that you do have rights when you're dealing with debt collectors. There are limits to what they can do, what they can say, and how they contact you. For instance, they can't contact you before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m. They can't contact you at work if you say, my boss and my workplace does not permit me to receive these sets of calls at work. They have to stop contacting you. Also, there are limits to what they can say. They can't threaten you. They can't repeatedly call you and harass you. They can't say um, make false statements that they're going to have you arrested and have money garnished from your check if they're not going to actually do that. So there are limits there. And then if you don't want to get contacted by a debt collector, even if you owe the money, you have a right to have them stop contacting you. You can write a certified letter, send it to their address, stating that they not contact you anymore, and they have to abide by that unless. Uh, they're taking action. Like, say they're going to file a lawsuit or something. Like but in general, they have to stop contacting you after you send that letter. So just keep in mind that even if you do owe debt, that you still have rights to be consumed and protected. That's really great to know. Um, before we kind of wrap up the topic of debt, I just wanted to see are there any other resources available out there, Marietta or Holly, um, that people should be aware of um, to help them deal with debt? Um, um, I'll jump in uh, if I might. First, and just say on our website, consumerfinance.gov, we do have a section called Ask CFPB. And on there we have uh, lots of frequently asked questions about consumer financial issues, and certainly debt collection is one of those issues. And there's even a, um, a tab you can click on that says debt collection, and you will find there answers to, I think, a lot of the, the common questions about what you know your situation with the debt collector might be, what they can or can't say or do. And uh, 
In addition to answers, we also have um, some template letters that you can use to help you write a letter back to that debt collector. Um, letters that say things like, I want to know more about this debt, or um, I don't believe this debt is mine, or uh, you need to stop contacting me. There's, there's a variety of template letters that we think may be very helpful for people. Um, you know, I think it's it can be very intimidating if you have a debt collector that's um, being very aggressive on the phone and um, you don't know what to answer. And sometimes it helps if you can take a step back, go take a look at our site. We can answer some of those questions. And, um, you know, you can then send that letter or use it as a model to say to the collector things like, show me that the debt is mine. Because in many cases, debt collectors um, buy up old debt for pennies on the dollar. And it may turn out that um, the information they got was wrong and it's a debt that you paid off ages ago, but they're going to keep hounding you for it. And, uh, you know, we want to help you with some strategies to um, make them be wrong, basically. That sounds great. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think that is definitely something we got a lot of questions asking what resources were out there. So letting people know um, about that great knowledge database is, is wonderful. Um, another area where we got um, several questions from people were about, um, we got questions specifically from family members of disabled uh, military members or veterans that wanted to know if there were any special protections against scams or fraud for those who were disabled or handicapped. Um, well, I can start by saying there's a few things we've addressed just recently. Um, in fact, we've got a couple blogs on our website that you can look at. One is um, there's an issue if you're getting Social Security disability income. There have been some problems where people in that situation have tried to qualify, for example, for a mortgage, and they've had the lender ask them to prove that they are disabled. In other words, to get a doctor's note or some statement saying how long they're going to be disabled or, you know, basically a lot of information that they should not be being asked for. So we did, uh, the CFPB did put out some guidance saying, you know, it's not okay to do that. If the VA has declared the service member disabled, then they're disabled. You don't need to go find out further information about the nature or duration of the disability. We also recently did a blog about um, in some cases, if a service member is 100% disabled with a service-connected disability and um, the likelihood that they'll be able to, and they have student loans, and the likelihood is because of that very severe disability, they may never be in a position to earn the kind of salary where they can pay off those loans. There is a provision where they may be able to get those loans forgiven. And uh, certainly we want them aware of that, but we also want to know if in some cases they've done that process and then the loan forgiveness has been reported incorrectly to the credit bureaus and it's been a negative on their credit score and it's lowered it significantly. And if that happens, um, we want to know about it for sure. I'll just mention um, a couple other things. Um, we do have an office for older Americans and um, they put out a guide, a series of guides really called Managing Someone Else's Money. And one of those guides is for what are called VA fiduciaries. And those are people who are in charge of managing the money for a veteran. Um, so it might be something that would be very pertinent for those who are trying to manage the finances for a severely disabled veteran. And uh, it's a free guide that you can get um, at, our, at our agency. And lastly, um, I guess one scam that we do see a lot of um, is directed really to veterans and uh, it, these, the scammers get their hooks into the veterans by promising that they will get them the benefits, that they'll get them quickly, that they guarantee that they'll get them. Um, in particular one called aid and attendance which is really designed for severely disabled veterans who don't have much money and need assistance with the daily activities of life. They need an attendant to help with that. And it can be, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month. But scammers use that as a lure. You know, I can guarantee I'll get you this, I'll get you, get it quickly for you. And it's basically a way for them to get into the veterans' finances. And in some cases, either to clean them out, or if they have too much money to qualify, they'll move their money into something that the veteran can't access. And then, you know, will declare that they qualify because they have no money. We saw one um, case where a veteran, they put his money into an annuity he wasn't going to be able to access until he was 90-something years old. 
So um, certainly I would just say um, don't forget the State Directors of Veterans Affairs. They definitely can help. Don't forget us. But also, um, you know, don't fall for somebody that tells you that they can help you get your benefits quickly um, and that they can guarantee them because that's likely to be a scam. That's, that's great advice. Um, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, we're going to switch to, uh, switch topics one more time um, to again another topic that came up a lot in the emails um, was dealing with mortgages um, and figuring out navigating that whole minefield, which can be pretty tricky. Um, so Holly, can you tell us some of the problems that you've seen in the work that you've done and what resources you've used to help people who have complained? Sure. Um, Mortgages really were uh, one of the first issues that I heard a lot about. Partly because of um, when the housing market went south, a lot of people owned homes and saw their value drop to the point where they were what, what we call underwater. In other words, the house was no longer worth what they owed for it. And uh, for active duty service members in particular, that was a real problem because um, they owned a house, they were making their payments, you know, that was all okay, but the house had gone underwater. And then the service member gets, would get orders to move. I don't mean a combat deployment. I mean what we call permanent change in station orders, where they would get orders to move to a new duty station somewhere else in the country or even overseas. And uh, what do they do then? They've got a house that they can't sell for enough to pay it off. And I discovered in that first year especially I was doing this job that a lot of the federal programs um, were kind of one-size-fits-all, and they did not take into account the unique challenges of a service member family. Um, for example, they really assumed in order to access the federal assistance programs that you would be delinquent on your mortgage. In other words, that you would be behind on your payments and that's why you, you need help. And I had to go in and explain, um, no, actually, for a service member, they may not be behind on their payments, but they're going to be if you know they can't get this situation fixed. So we were able to um, get some see some changes made. Um, Treasury, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac all changed the policy to say that a military PCS move was a qualifying hardship for their programs without the service member being delinquent. And then um, I guess I was a little pushy and I went farther to the topic of um, owner occupied because so many of the programs assume the owner would be occupying the house. Well, you know, for a service member, that's not the way it works. I myself, in 37 years of active duty life, we moved 24 times. You can't stay in the house, you know. Um, and what some service members were doing was they were leaving their family in the house and going by themselves to the new duty station, which I thought was really unfortunate. Um, so we did get Treasury to change their uh, HAMP program to say that they would still consider the homeowner occupied if the service member intended to come back to it and did not buy another house somewhere else. So that was, I think, very helpful. And uh, in the end, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and they oversee Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, which is about, I think, more than half of U.S. mortgages, um, they decided on the basis of what we talked about that they would say, if a service member with a Fannie or Freddie mortgage had to do a short sale, in other words, sell the house short of what they owed, um, because of a BCS move, that they would forgive the difference between what they could sell it for and what they owed, which was a really exciting development, as you can imagine. And that went into effect in November of 2012. So um, certainly, you know, very gratifying to see that um, happen and to be able just to articulate a little bit that uh, you know military life can be unique in some ways and uh, some programs while well intentioned don't always fit fit that community in a way they can take advantage of. And I will say um, that my office also works a lot with the VA home loan program. Uh, when we first opened our uh, doors in July of 11, our first complaint category that we opened up was um, credit cards, but um, we knew that we might have people calling about mortgages and calling with complaints that couldn't wait. In other words, about to be foreclosed on. So we thought, you know, what can we do? And we did arrange to refer them to housing counselor health. But I also talked to the VA home loan program folks and they said, if it's a veteran, you know, we want you to refer them to us because we may know about benefits that they would qualify for that could help them in this situation. So. Um, 
you know, we've had great working relationship with the VA home loan program, and they also have a version of a short sale for VA loans called a compromise sale. And uh, that would certainly be another resource for a service member to think about if they have a VA home loan. They can find help there. Um, if they have another type of mortgage and they have issues, um, they can file a complaint with us if they feel that, you know, that they have cause for complaint. Or again, they can go to Ask CFPB and uh, hopefully find some answers to their questions. That's really great. And it's, just, it's great to hear the steps that you made in just, a, I guess, a few short years um, to kind of make these programs um, fit some of the some of the unique issues that service members and, and our military families might have. Um, Marietta, I know the Consumer Action Handbook also has a ton of great information um, for people um, dealing with mortgages or who might be looking to refinance. Can you maybe share a few of the top things that people should be aware of? Sure. And in the Consumer Action Handbook, as you said, you know, we address housing is one of the biggest, the biggest probably um, investment or consumer purchase that most people make. And so there are a couple aspects that we address in the handbook. One, thinking about when you're buying a home, you're not just shopping for a house or your neighborhood, but you're also shopping for a realtor, you're shopping for a broker, you're shopping for a bank. And so you need to do due diligence when you're shopping for those parts of the to the process as well. So you need to make certain that the representatives that you're working with, the professionals are licensed, that they have you know, certifications that they're supposed to have, that there aren't complaints or, you know, records of wrongdoing, you know, with state consumer protection offices or banks. So definitely you want to keep the home on that part of it. Also, you want to compare those interest rates for the potential loans you can get. So a good idea is to take the value of a home that you're interested in buying and take and shop it to several lenders and see what rates and what interest rates and broker fees and things that they'd offer for the same house. And so then you're able to compare apples to apples side by side and determine which deal is the best deal for you. And then finally, refinancing, you know, is very popular, particularly over the last few years. And you want to think about when refinancing, the purpose is to reduce the amount of money that you're paying on a loan. But you want to make certain that you're getting a good deal in the sense that the cost to refinance, there are there are fees involved with that, appraisal fees and broker fees and points and maybe early terminations of your current mortgage. So you want to make certain that the amount of savings that you'll earn or you know have over the life of the rest of your loan or new loan will be greater than the cost or the expenses involved with refinancing. Um, those are just a few tips. There are a lot of more mortgage related things there uh, available. Particularly CFPB has some new great rules about your right to know and ability to pay rules um, so that you're not in loans that you can't afford. But just when you're doing that initial shopping, being able to do your homework is going to be a key critical component of getting you know, a good deal. That's, yeah, I think that's a really important point you bring up um, about doing your homework and your research. Um, and I know we've shared a ton of great information today on, a, on several different topics, um, and it could be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so let's wrap up with one kind of final question to pull all of this together. Um, and Holly, we'll start with you, and then Marietta, you can answer as well. Um, our last question um, is, are there things that service members and veterans can do to protect themselves as consumers? And what are what are the ways that they can be smarter consumers when they are going out and making some of these big decisions? Sure, um, there's a number of things they can do. I think um, you know one is obviously just to be an educated consumer. Um, they should all, if they haven't done it, they need to check their credit report. I would say that's one of the first things that they need to do, and uh, they need to do it at annualcreditreport.com, which is the official site where they can actually get it for free, despite all the catchy advertisements you may see. Um, that's the one, and uh, they may find a surprise. You know, I think. Um, if you have a common name, there's a, quite a likelihood you may have someone else's information on your credit report. So even if you know that you've done everything right, that doesn't mean that your credit score may not have an error in your credit report, and you can fix that. Um, you can, If you see an error, you can contact the credit bureau and say, this isn't my debt, or this is a debt I paid off, and uh, if you have if you don't get satisfaction from that, that's when we would want to hear a complaint because we do um, supervise the large credit reporting agencies. So uh, we'd be very interested to hear that. So check your credit report. That'll give you an idea of, um, you know, frankly, the the kind of interest rate you might get. Um, I would also say this is a little out of my lane, but if you're going to invest money with somebody, check out their credentials. Um, they're um, 
a partner, uh, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA.org, actually has a feature called Broker Check where you can look them up. And uh, I remember a scam near in North Carolina where uh, these three guys who just had a big idea and were completely shady got about $8 million of people's money. And nobody bothered to check and see if they were even licensed brokers. They weren't. So um, obviously, buyer beware. Um, check the total cost of the item. Don't focus on the monthly payment. That's often how it's marketed. But you know, what's the total cost? Some of this sounds very basic, but um, and don't let yourself be rushed into a decision. You can always walk away and say, "Let me think about this." And if you're an active military, you can take it to your JAG. Um, you know, you can you can look it up. You can do some research and see if you're really getting a good deal. And um, you'll save yourself a lot of heartache if you do some of those things before you sign on the dotted line. Because once you sign the contract, then it's very difficult um, to, to, to get out of it. You're committed. And uh, sometimes you may be paying for that mistake for years. And just one last reminder, ask CFPB, consumerfinance.gov. Wonderful. Marietta, did you have anything you wanted to add? She covered a lot of great information in her uh, comments, but I do have a couple more things. I would suggest, honestly, to get a copy of the Consumer Action Handbook. Again, you can order a copy at publications.usa.gov or download an electronic version to an e-reader or your computer. It has a lot of great information on a wide variety of consumer issues, so it will help you be a smarter consumer right there. Um, use the resources that you have available. You know, Holly talked about the JAG officers on basis, but then your family readiness centers and people who are, you know, really connected to that community and that, that city or that neighborhood who know what companies are reputable which ones are a little shady and you might want to avoid. Um, they have a good pulse on what that community has to offer. And so taking advantage of that is going to be key, as well as using information from other government agencies. Holly has pointed out so many CFPB resources available, but CFPB is not the only agency that has great info. USA.gov has a lot of information for consumers, military, veteran um, audiences, FTC, the VA, those are all great resources to tap into websites as well as the state consumer protection offices because in many times a lot of consumer related issues are regulated on a state level. For instance, if you buy a car and it breaks down 10 times in a month, you may have a lemon, but that's regulated on a state level versus a federal level. So being able to use those resources is key. And then also take advantage of some of the protections that you have as a military. Um, personnel is going to be key. You have some great protections that we as civilians don't have. For instance, if you go on active duty or you're deployed, you can put an active duty alert on your credit report so that no one can apply for credit fraudulently while you're away or on, on orders. And that's a great protection to know and peace of mind to know that you're protected from identity thieves. Because they're, you know, they're rampant. It's a, you know, it's one of the top complaint areas that we hear about a lot. So, just taking care of those is a good thing. And then just reading contracts before you sign them. Um, don't get pressured into buying things or high pressure tactics. Um, don't sign things with blank spaces. And just being informed and just knowing you don't know everything, but ask questions of the people who do and it can lead you in the right direction. I think those are all key. Well, I think all of this was really great information, um, and we are unfortunately just about out of time for today. So I want to thank everybody who tuned in to watch today, and I want to thank Marietta and Holly for being here with us and sharing all this great information and these fantastic resources. If you still have questions or if you need to file a complaint, you can contact the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov. And if you did want to get a copy of the Consumer Action Handbook, you can get that at publications.usa.gov. Thank you again for joining us, and we will see you next time.